Do you need a lawyer in order to get conservatorship or guardianship, or can you do that on your own? This is a great question. You can get a lawyer. You do not need a lawyer. You do have to file some legal forms and things with the uh, public guardian's office, but you definitely don't need a lawyer. What I will warn people is that by virtue of just making bad decisions, which we all probably have done in our lives, that does not mean that someone will be able and eligible for guardianship or conservatorship. So if you do file on behalf of your loved ones because you're trying to keep them safe, that is great. That's what it's there for. You just will have to have lots of documentation about the poor decisions and their lack of ability to, to make good decisions for themselves. If they have cognitive impairment or physical impairments or mental impairments that make that difficult. So just make sure you have your, your paperwork in order in situations because your loved one will be, what's it called, subpoenaed, will be told that they're getting, someone's going up for conservatorship for them. So they will be able to defend themselves and go in front of a judge. And as you guys all know, when you come to the centers of excellence, your loved one can put on a very good show for usually at least an hour or so in front of the doctor. Everything's fine. We're all good. They can do that in front of a judge too. So Make sure you have all your, your paperwork in order, but you definitely do not need to pay a lawyer for that process, unless, of course, you want to. Thank you. Fantastic. The next question is for Dr. Duffy, and this is something that we hear a lot of um, caregivers talk about. So my son's doctor keeps telling us that we should reduce caffeine because of sleep. I feel like HD has already taken so much from my son. I don't want him to not, or I don't want him to have to reduce the one thing that he loves, how important is this? This comes up a lot. And actually it came up yesterday in our HD clinic, funnily enough. I like to say everything within reason, right? And I don't like to have any hard stops on anything. And we do have to understand that it's about quality of life, right? And that if there is something that someone really enjoys, like caffeine, that's not particularly you know, toxic or harmful. We're not talking about alcohol or drugs, right? But caffeine, that gives us a little bit of a jolt and a little bit of oomph in our step. I think it's okay within reason with the understanding that, yes, there are things that caffeine affects and it affects all of us human beings. If we have a couple too many cups of coffee, we get a little bit shaky. We get a little anxious. It gets things going. We're not thinking as clearly once we cross that threshold of too much caffeine. And if we drink too much caffeine too late in the day, it will absolutely affect our sleep cycle. So I think about it as, hey, where we really need the caffeine is in the morning to get our day started. So let's front load things. Let's have our cup of coffee. And that might be one, one and a half, maybe two. But beyond that, we start getting to more higher increases in caffeine. And it can make Korea worse. It can make anxiety worse. It can make thinking clearly a bit worse and sleep worse. So there is a threshold where we go over it and everybody's different. Their tolerance is different. So it's a bit of trial and error. I would say, okay, let's try this cup of coffee, maybe some little bit of milk water down, and let's figure out what the perfect amount would be for you to get your day going and something that you can enjoy and potentially sip throughout the day. And then we find, okay, 2 p.m. is our stop time because anything after that will affect our sleep-wake cycle. And we need enough number of hours to process the caffeine so that we're ready to go to sleep at, at a reasonable time. So again, everything within reason. Uh, and I, it, it's a little bit of a conversation between you and your loved one and what works best. All right. And then, so thank you, Dr. Duffy. Our next one, Dr. Donith because I didn't really, we didn't do bios on it, but he is a psychiatrist. So <laughs> this is why these questions are coming your way. What are some ideas to get ahead of a crisis? I hear about things happening all the time to families. And what are some things I can do, do to prepare myself in case a crisis occurs? This question, often I have conversations with patients after the fact or family members after the fact when a crisis occurs. And I love the idea of planning ahead. Uh, I think first and foremost, crisis is a big, broad term. And so if safety or acute safety is ever a concern for any family member, using emergency resources, of course, 911, local emergency room, um, these kind of things are, are what I would recommend. 
if if the crisis is related to irritability or agitation, which I often find is a big topic of discussion with uh, family members and their loved ones with HD, um, I like to include the patient in the conversation first and foremost. What are the things that are causing you to lose your temper or become agitated or physically or emotionally violent? And what are some ways that we can support you in expressing that in ways that, you know, feel make you feel supported? And so some people will tell me, I need some alone time, I need to burn off steam, and then we game plan how that will be done in a safe and supported manner, and if that needs supervision or not. And it can be pretty creative, and some families have provided stacks and stacks of paper that can be ripped apart when people are very angry or stuffies or these large squeezable stuffed animals um, that you can rip apart or tear apart and these kind of things. So I'd say getting the person and the loved one involved uh, early on and, and figuring out what's leading to these outbursts and how we can help support them. Um, I think asking them to bottle it up or get over it or hold things together is not productive. Um, and so finding ways that, that your loved one can express themselves in a way that isn't dangerous, I think is a big thing. But again, I, if I can review again, if the crisis involves any type of safety concern, suicidality, physical injury, damage to property that poses risk to self or others, calling 911, knowing where your local emergency room is, and potentially getting a letter from your providers. We talk about this a lot in clinic too, that law enforcement may or may not know how to interact with patients with HD and having maybe some documentation before the, before the fact so that emergency resources can interact appropriately and can triage your loved ones to appropriate mental health, physical health rehabilitation and not the legal situations that we often have to work through. So I think that's where I'd Thank you. And I'll take that opportunity to quickly plug LEAP. If you guys are looking for any training materials to help train your local law enforcement, we do have free kits that we give out at Help for HD. And to receive that, you can contact us on our website, or you can just simply email Vicki, V-I-C-K-I at helpforhd.org. And you'll get a free kit, including an ID card and some other information and being proactive. So going to your local law enforcement if you move to a new town or even now, and just maybe explaining what HD is and how there may be interactions in the future, maybe not, but just to prep local law enforcement is also handy. So thanks for that. <laughs> nice huge, opportunity. Uh, huge shout out to Teva and Griffin Foundation for making us be able to send those out for free. For we free. send out hundreds yeah. and hundreds a year. So that's Absolutely. awesome. Thank you guys so much. Next question, Dr. Duffy. My husband keeps having accidents, both urine and diarrhea. I think it is time that we start using adult depends, but I don't know how to address it. The accidents don't seem to bother him, but it is creating a large mess for me. Any thoughts? Yeah, this can be tricky. I think any time that your loved one has progression of their disease and it is a marker of loss of independence, whether that be working, handling finances, driving, daily functions, daily ability to take care of oneself, it's always a marker of loss of independence. And that can be really hard for an individual. And then you pair that with Huntington's disease, where there's a lot of lack of insight and a lot of lack of awareness. And it's not intentional. It's really just part of the disease. They're not really aware uh, of what's going on. And something that seems so blatantly obvious to us just really isn't for them. And things that we think would bother an individual really don't. So we have to, one, be careful about superimposing our own experiences and thoughts about those experiences and take a step back and realize that this disease affects one's ability to experience those things. Um, uh, obviously, loss of urine and bowel movements is incredibly impactful um, for hygiene of the, the, the loved one as well as around the house and toileting. Um, and it can be a very sensitive subject to address, right? And if you as the loved one feels uncomfortable addressing it, I think it's really important to put that responsibility and that conversation upon the medical team. And we are always happy to have these conversations. Same thing around hypersexuality, right? These are really difficult conversations to have. 
And we often reach out to participants as well as loved ones to say, hey, you're coming into clinic. What's happening? What do we need to address? What do we need to talk about? And we can do it in a very sensitive manner where we bring it to the table and it's not brought by the loved one. So we can say, how are your activities of daily living? I mean, how are you caring for yourself? How are you dressing yourself? How are you feeding yourself? How is toileting going to the bathroom? Are you having any accidents? Please tell me around that what's happening. And oftentimes that opens up the door for the loved one to, to weigh in. Oh yeah, remember sweetheart when we had that accident the other day and we really had to clean that up. And then we can do a deeper dive into it and say, oh, how can we keep you um, safe and clean? And how can we navigate this? And these are the things that I would recommend. And oftentimes we'll use adult um, diapers during the day or systems at night to help navigate this. Helps you keep you clean. It helps navigate any skin breakdown to keep you safe so there's no infection. And really wrapping it around the medical aspect of it really helps people um, embrace that this is something that they're doing to keep themselves healthy, right? And often that really helps navigate these trickier situations. And we're always happy to have those conversations about driving, about any of those kind of really, I call them kind of trigger topics or just uncomfortable places to go. We're happy to go there with you. And I'll just add to that, you know, uh, Yes, everything Dr. Duffy said is yes. If you are in a rural area and you can't get to your doctor or whatever, and it's been a situation where you just really need to start something now, we have had families that will purchase them. First, it's the language you use. So a lot of times we'll say, you're having accidents. Is this something that, that bothers you? A lot of times it does bother them, but they don't necessarily know how to express it. And if they say, no, it doesn't bother me, it's okay. And you maybe approach it again later, but it's called, I call them briefs and some families have purchased briefs and put them in the bathroom or put them where their loved one, put them in the underwear drawer where they, and their loved one kind of just takes it because it does actually bother them and they didn't know how to problem solve it. So they put them on themselves and they feel like it's magic and it is a little bit, but you can try some of those things just to be a little bit more discreet and sensitive about that topic because it is a hard topic. No one likes to be told what to do. So no one wants to be told, hey, you have to wear adult diapers now because you're making a mess and it's causing problems for me. Just like Dr. Duffy said, approach it in a sensitive manner and lay some seeds as the weeks approach to try to see if they will just gradually come aboard. Yeah, it makes you think about walkers too. Oftentimes we'll, we have a walker in our clinic and walkers are a difficult transition, right? Because again, it's a milestone of loss of independence. And we have a walker in our uh, clinic that we'll often bring into the clinic room and just, I call her our walker big red because it's this beautiful red walker. And um, we just introduce the walker to um, to our patient and, and their loved ones and just show them the ease of movement and have them walk with it and just experience it. And then often we'll say, okay, why don't you get one? Just put it in the house, stick it in the corner of the room, have it become part of the landscape so people can get comfortable with it. And then eventually it'll start being incorporated in, in some every other day, every third day, every day use introduction and just making it a, a, a new normal in a sense. I love that Lisa. 